Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin made his first public appearance since being hospitalized for complications related to a prostate cancer procedure. Speaking at a virtual meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, Austin reiterated support for Ukraine and thanked foreign allies for security assistance. He called for more aid to Ukraine amid ongoing congressional debates on a national security supplemental aid package. Austin, working remotely since his hospital release, emphasized the importance of a sovereign and secure Ukraine for global security. Despite inquiries into his delayed hospitalization disclosure, Austin committed to taking responsibility and improving communication. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken pledged $45 million in additional financing to address conflict and enhance stability in coastal West Africa, grappling with increased insecurity from jihadist insurgencies. Currently on a four-nation tour of Africa, Blinken visited Ivory Coast, where he met President Alassane Ouattara and discussed mutual security challenges, acknowledging Ivory Coast's leadership in countering extremism. The funding supplements the $300 million already invested by the U.S. in coastal West Africa over the past two years, focusing on military training and civil protection. The visit addresses security challenges, the aftermath of a coup in Niger, and concerns about Russia's growing influence in the region. The U.S. faced setbacks in the Sahel, notably with the coup in Niger, impacting its fight against militants. The tour aims to strengthen U.S.-African partnerships in various areas, including trade, climate, infrastructure, health, and security. The Embassy of Hungary in Ukraine reportedly received death threats directed at Peter Sajarto, Hungary's Minister of Foreign Affairs, ahead of his visit to Uzerod. The threatening letter, written in Ukrainian, expressed hostility towards the Hungarian government, accusing it of working against Ukraine in the war. The message warned of an explosive reception awaiting Sajardo on January 29 and advised preparations for a funeral, ending with the statement, God forgives, but Ukrainians do not. Despite the threats, Hungary's State Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Thomas Menkser, emphasized that Sajardo would not be deterred in representing Hungary's interests. The upcoming meeting on January 29 between the foreign ministers of Ukraine and Hungary in Uzerod is intended to prepare for discussions between Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Orban had accepted Zelensky's invitation to discuss bilateral issues, contingent on prior preparation by the foreign ministers. The United States, despite running out of funding to support Ukraine in its war with Russia, is urging about 50 allies worldwide to continue providing assistance. The monthly defense meeting, hosted by the U.S. since April 2022, has been a key source of financing for Ukraine. However, with no available funds, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is seeking support from other countries to send ammunition and missiles until Congress passes a budget with funds for Ukraine. The U.S. has been depleting its stockpiles and using Congress-allocated funding to aid Ukraine but has not been able to provide additional munitions since December 2023. The ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine continues to escalate. With over $110 billion in aid for both Ukraine and Israel currently stalled due to funding disagreements between the Democratic-controlled U.S. Senate and the Republican majority in the U.S. House of Representatives. The situation remains challenging, with Russia showing no willingness to end the conflict, and the United Nations ruling out any peace plan backed by Kiev and the West. Defense Secretary Austin, still recovering from prostate cancer surgery, emphasized the importance of continued global support for a sovereign and secure Ukraine during the virtual meeting. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Egypt's Abdel Fattah al-Sisi inaugurated the construction of the final unit at Egypt's Daba nuclear power plant via video link. The plant, built by the Russian state corporation Rosatom at a reported cost of $30 billion, will consist of four power units with a combined capacity of 4.8 gigawatts. Egypt, facing rising power demand from its 105 million population, aims to become a regional energy hub, exporting electricity to neighboring countries and diversifying energy sources. The move towards nuclear energy is seen as crucial to meeting growing demand. The cooperation between Russia and Egypt on this project was initiated in 2015, with Russia providing a loan to cover the construction costs. The Daba nuclear power plant is part of Russia's broader global nuclear ambitions, with involvement in projects in India, Hungary, Turkey, China, and Bangladesh. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has maintained the doomsday clock at 90 seconds to midnight, indicating the proximity to global catastrophe. 
Factors influencing this decision include Russia's actions on nuclear weapons during the invasion of Ukraine, Israel's Gaza war, and escalating climate change. The Chicago based nonprofit, which created the clock in 1947, assesses existential risks such as nuclear threats, climate change, and disruptive technologies. Tensions from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, potential use of nuclear weapons, and geopolitical actions contribute to the increased risk. Israel's nuclear status and its conflict with Hamas are also cited as concerns. The impact of climate change, with 2023 being the hottest year on record, further contributes to global instability, despite record-breaking clean energy investments. The clock underscores the urgent need for addressing these threats on a global scale. Following successful drone attacks on targets in Leningrad Oblast, S-300 air defense systems are reportedly being installed around St. Petersburg, as captured in a video. The deployment is seen as a response to recent drone incidents. Telegram channels initially reported explosions on January 21, followed by a fire in the port of U.S. Luga in Leningrad Oblast, where residents heard drone sounds. The fire occurred at Novatex Terminal, Russia's largest independent natural gas producer, reportedly targeted in a special operation by Ukraine's SBU security service. The terminal processes fuel for the Russian military, and damaging it could impact Russian military logistics and economic resources for waging war in Ukraine. Ukrainian drones also targeted an oil depot in Leningrad Oblast on January 18 in an operation by Ukraine's main intelligence directorate. An attack in the Gaza Strip on Monday resulted in the death of 21 Israeli soldiers, marking the deadliest incident for Israeli forces since the Hamas-led massacre on October 7 that triggered the ongoing conflict. The Israeli military reported that reservists were preparing explosives to demolish two buildings in central Gaza when a militant fired a rocket-propelled grenade at a nearby tank. The blast triggered the explosives, causing the collapse of both two-story buildings on the soldiers. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu expressed mourning for the soldiers, calling Monday one of the hardest days since the war began. The total number of Israeli soldiers killed since the ground offensive began in late October is at least 217 including three in a separate event on Monday. The attack may pose a setback to renewed calls for a ceasefire, as Netanyahu vowed to continue the war until absolute victory. Ground forces also encircled the southern city of Khan Yunus, claiming that Hamas leaders are hiding there. Efforts for a second ceasefire are ongoing, with reports of Israel proposing a two-month ceasefire in exchange for the release of remaining hostages. Hamas rejected the proposal, insisting on an end to the offensive and Israeli withdrawal from Gaza before releasing more hostages. The Israeli army announced on Tuesday that it is intensifying its campaign in Khan Yunus, the main city in southern Gaza, where it believes Hamas military leaders have their stronghold. The Israel Defense Forces, IDF, stated that they have conducted an extensive operation, encircling and deepening their presence in the area. The IDF reported the killing of dozens of terrorists in the past 24 hours in Khan Yunus, with ground troops engaged in close-quarters combat with militants. Israel suspects that senior Hamas officials are hiding in tunnels in Khan Yunus and that the militants are holding Israeli hostages in the extensive underground network. The military operations involve hand-to-hand -hand fighting on the ground and frequent airstrikes from above. The move marks an escalation in the ongoing conflict in the southern Gaza Strip. Yemen's Houthi movement, allied with Iran, claimed on Monday to have launched a missile attack on the American military cargo ship Ocean Jazz in the Gulf of Aden. The statement did not provide details on when or where the attack occurred, and there has been no immediate confirmation or comment from the U.S. military. Houthi military spokesperson Yehya Saria stated that their forces would retaliate against any American or British aggression, targeting perceived threats in the Red and Arab Sea. In recent weeks, U.S. and British forces have conducted strikes in Yemen in response to Houthi attacks on Red Sea shipping. The Houthis had initially targeted vessels linked to Israel but expanded their threats to include U.S. vessels after the foreign strikes. The attacks have disrupted trade between Asia and Europe and raised concerns globally. The Houthis justify their actions as solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza facing Israeli attacks. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak warned Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen that the UK would conduct new military actions if the rebels continue attacking shipping in the Red Sea. Sunak stated that while the UK is not seeking confrontation, it will respond in self-defense if necessary.
The Royal Air Force, in collaboration with the United States, carried out strikes on two military sites north of Yemen's capital, Sana'a, targeting Houthi facilities supporting attacks on shipping. Sunak emphasized that the strikes were limited, in accordance with international law, and aimed at degrading Houthi capabilities. The Houthi rebels have vowed to continue their attacks, and tensions are escalating in the Middle East. Connected to the Israel-Hamas conflict Experts note the difficulty of the situation, suggesting that the transatlantic allies faced challenging choices with potential regional escalation risks. Some argue for international support through the UN General Assembly to make policy choices more rational. A group of UN human rights experts has called on Hong Kong to drop all charges against Jimmy Lai, the former media mogul currently on trial for sedition and colluding with foreign forces. The experts expressed concern about multiple and serious violations of Lai's freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, association, and his right to a fair trial. They cited issues such as Lai's inability to access a lawyer of his own choosing and the alleged hand-picking of judges by the authorities. Lai's arrest and criminal proceedings are seen as directly related to his criticism of China's government and support for democracy in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's chief secretary Chan Kwok Ki responded, stating that commenting on or interfering with ongoing legal proceedings is inappropriate. And the suggestion of immunity from legal consequences for illegal acts is akin to advocating a special pass to break the law. Lai faces charges under the national security law imposed by Beijing, with potential life imprisonment, and a colonial-era sedition charge carrying a maximum penalty of two years in prison. Western governments are closely monitoring the trial, and a conviction could impact China's relations with the US and UK. Ecuador's police announced the capture of the leader of the Colombian armed group Oliver Sinistera, known as Carlos L. or El Gringo. Authorities stated that he would be returned to Colombia following the arrest. The capture occurred amid Ecuador's military offensive against criminal gangs, with the government declaring a state of emergency and implementing a nighttime curfew. Carlos L. was apprehended in Imbabura, in northern Ecuador, after three months of security force preparations. The police commander mentioned that an immigration hearing would be held to expel him from Ecuador and send him to Colombia, emphasizing his significant criminal record. Carlos L. was reportedly involved in criminal activities in Ecuador, particularly with terrorist groups near the border with Colombia. Oliver Sinistera is a faction of the Segunda Marquetalia group, consisting of dissident rebels from the demobilized Revolutionary Forces of Colombia, FARC, who abandoned a 2016 peace deal. Former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has announced his retirement from politics, ending speculation about his future following the 2022 election defeat. Morrison, 55, stated that he would resign from Parliament by the end of February to take on new challenges in the global corporate sector and spend more time with his family. Morrison, a member of the centre-right Liberal Party, was first elected in 2007 and rose through the ranks, becoming Prime Minister in 2018. His tenure will be mainly remembered for his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, implementing strict border controls and a significant fiscal stimulus. However, his popularity waned as restrictions lifted, and the government faced criticism for issues like vaccine distribution. Morrison lost the 2022 election to Labour's Anthony Albanese, and revelations about his secret swearing into ministerial portfolios during the pandemic sparked controversy within his party.